Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished studying Acts chapter 8 three weeks ago. Acts chapter 8 was predominantly about Philip, who was one of the first deacons. Paul referred to him as Philip the Evangelist, and we saw why he called him that after studying chapter 8. As we come to chapter 9, we enter into the conversion of Saul, who we know by his Greek name as Paul. This chapter is important because it outlines his conversion. He eventually became the apostle to the Gentiles. The door to the salvation of the Gentiles was getting ready to swing wide open, and this is a very significant event in the history of mankind. Verses 1-9 through nine give us a glimpse of the provenient grace that led Saul to receive saving grace that brought him to salvation. Provenient grace is God's unmerited favor that leads people to salvation. Saving grace is what saves people, and that same grace is what people need to remain in God's salvation. The Lord won't force anybody to be saved who doesn't want to be saved. Provenient grace doesn't save people, and they don't receive His grace because they are deserving of it. The very nature of grace is that the Lord gives it to people who are totally undeserving of it. No one has the inherent right to receive from God His grace, nor can people earn it. Grace is a divine gift. Whether it's provenient or saving grace, it's always 100% the gift of God. Those who make heaven their eternal home will be there by grace alone, and this will be the same throughout all eternity. Provenient grace is the work of the Holy Spirit who uses the events people go through to help them see their desperate need of a Savior. Yet the giving of provenient grace doesn't mean people will by faith receive saving grace. All it means is that God is being true to who He is in His loving and compassionate nature and giving them an opportunity to be saved. Left to ourselves, we would never seek after God and His salvation. It's not within our sinful nature. The Lord is always the first cause in our salvation. First He calls us, and then He saves all those who want Him and His salvation. All this is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was calling us to Himself before we ever knew we needed Him or had a desire to go to Him. Provenient grace speaks of how the Holy Spirit even uses our sin and the sin of others to open our eyes to our need for salvation. It's the Lord's loving kindness that lets us feel the wages of our sin and the emptiness our soul experiences after we have chased after this world and found it to be vanity and vexation of spirit. We get our first glimpse of provenient grace operating in the life of Paul in Acts chapter 7, verses 56 through 58. But the Lord was working in the man before that. Standing before the Sanhedrin council, Stephen said, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This vision so enraged the people in attendance at the council that they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, dragging him out of the city, and began to stone him. We are then told, meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul watched the phony trial of Stephen, heard his sermon, saw his face glow with the glory of God. When the insane mob drug Stephen out of the council chambers to stone him to death, Saul may have been leading this violent mob. Those murdering the church's first martyr laid their cloaks at Saul's feet, and they did this because he was the representative of the Sanhedrin council in this setting. Saul was sanctioning the murder of Stephen, and the council stood behind his actions. We don't know if any members of the Sanhedrin were at the stoning of Stephen, for if they were, Saul eclipsed them by being the man the religious Jews looked at to sanction their murderous act. Then in chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The murder of Stephen became an impetus that produced the terrible persecution against the saints in Jerusalem, and even reaching into Samaria, and it's reasonable to believe that it was all led by Saul. We know that Saul was heading up a team that was going to Damascus to begin persecuting the saints there, and we find this in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. 
He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. The point that Saul was still breathing out murderous threats presents the idea that he was a moving force behind the persecution of the saints from the beginning. This also reveals the intense anger, hate, and agitation he felt over the growth of the infant church. He also believed that the way must be stamped out at any cost, for according to his narrow understanding, the Lord would judge Israel if they allowed this heretical teaching to continue. Saul was aggressive in his pursuit of Christ's followers, thinking he was serving God in a very important way. How strange! He was the one that was fighting against God because he had a distorted view of who God is and how to please Him. Saul was out to be a mover and shaker in Israel, and he was moving in high circles of power among the religious elite. It's obvious that he had access to the high priests, and he was personally educated by Gamaliel, a leading power in the Sanhedrin council. The letters he received from the high priests were addressed to the synagogue rulers, who would know who in their congregation or community was part of the way. They were looking for eyewitnesses so that they could bring charges of blasphemy against those who were followers of Jesus. It doesn't say that Saul was given the authority to execute Christians, but to only take them back to the Sanhedrin who would determine their guilt and subsequent punishment. His aggression was so intense that he wasn't looking only to imprison men, but women as well, for he had a fanatical determination to totally destroy the church. When Paul testified before King Agrippa, he declared in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. When this religious extremist was genuinely converted, the perverted areas of his character were conquered by God, and he became a wonderful example of what it means to love Jesus supremely. Dr. Luke continued telling Paul's story of salvation in verses 3 and 4. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This is a radical expression of pervenient grace. The Lord had been working in Saul's heart prior to this divine confrontation, but things had come to a climax, and the Lord wanted to not only save the man, but to stop him from doing permanent damage to the church. The Lord shook this man to the core of his being. He was undone in the presence of God. This is what it took to get this man's attention. This happened after the high priest sanctioned Saul's heartless pursuit of innocent, God-loving people. He was on his way to Damascus with other Jews that were going to help him round up as many believers as possible. That this divine confrontation happened with eyewitnesses is a powerful support to what would take place a few days later. I wonder how many of those men that were with Saul became followers of Jesus as a result of the Lord knocking him to the ground. This is a good spot for me to spout off one of my pet peeves. God is not a gentleman, as so many preachers claim, and as you hear again and again in a host of ways. He has never been a gentleman, and he never will be a gentleman. Besides, what kind of gentleman is he? A British gentleman? Or maybe a Middle Eastern gentleman? an Asian, African, or maybe an American gentleman. The definition of gentleman differs between these diverse cultures. Because a person is a gentleman doesn't mean that he is godly, good, or even kind. Jesus never strove to be a gentleman, but he was who he is, a savior. Gentlemen don't knock people to the ground, terrify them, and then leave them blind. But that's what the savior did to this religious man that was thoroughly deceived. A supernatural light suddenly shined upon Saul, and in two later events where Paul testified about what happened to him, he said that it was around noon or midday. Now think about this for a moment. These men were walking through a hot desert. The sun was intense, and the light that shined on Saul eclipsed the noonday sun. 
This doesn't mean that heat had to accompany the light, as if everything immediately increased 50 or 100 degrees. Yet the light was so intense that it left Saul blind and overwhelmed him to the point that he knew the light came from God. Now add to this tear the voice of God saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And you are sure to have one scared man. What a terrifying statement the Lord spoke to Saul. He knew this was the voice of God, but there's something interesting to this. The Holy Spirit had been pursuing Saul more aggressively than Saul had been pursuing Christians. His conscience must have been under deep conviction, but he didn't understand what all this meant. When the light came flashing upon him, followed by the divine voice that exposed what Saul was doing, Saul quickly learned that he was persecuting God and his people. He wasn't persecuting a cult or a sect. With all Paul's training as a Pharisee, he had a certain fear of God, and to hear that he was literally persecuting God's people would make one's blood run cold with fear. Saul's guilt was rushing at him as fast as the light from heaven shined upon him. Saul gave the only right response to the situation, which is found in verse 5. Who are you, Lord? He knew what was happening wasn't demonic or anything from the natural world. He knew that it was the Lord coming to him, but now he was questioning who the Lord really was since he just learned that he was persecuting the God who was speaking to him. The Lord responded in a way Saul would have never thought, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Those seven words totally shook Saul's world. In one moment, he saw that everything he had done to that point in his life was hostile to God the God he claimed to serve, and his life was a lie. The truth that was breaking into his heart and mind had to be agonizing, to say the least. I imagine that Saul laid on the ground utterly dumbfounded and unable to speak for some time. Here was a revelation that would take a long time to get his mind around. God had come to him, and his name was Jesus, whom the Sanhedrin had the Romans crucify. What the martyr Stephen said was true. What other believers testified under persecution were facts, not fiction or a false religion conjured up by devils. Saul was fighting against God. He was an enemy of God. And what a terrifying revelation that would be to one who thought he had dedicated his life to God. Before we look at what the Lord tells Saul to do, I want to make it clear that Saul wasn't knocked off a horse. Actually, a horse is nowhere in the historical account. This thought came from an old famous painter that depicted Paul being knocked off of a horse and people took it as gospel truth, though there's no biblical basis for such an idea. The Lord didn't give Saul any time to process what he just said, for the next moment Jesus gave him a command, Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. No nonsense here, no touchy-feely encouraging word that would soften the conviction. Saul needed to feel the weight of his sin, for to this point he didn't think of himself as a sinner, but a righteous man who kept the Mosaic law. The Holy Spirit knows when and how to bring comfort to people, and he won't bring it until conviction has done its perfect work. I have seen people at altars weeping over their sin, and then someone tries to comfort them, and this most always thwarts the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. To comfort those who God hasn't comforted is an extremely destructive thing to do. I learned as a young pastor that it's not my job to tell anyone they are a Christian. That's the Holy Spirit's job. If the Holy Spirit hasn't told them that they are a true Christian, then we can fight against God by telling someone that they're a believer when they aren't. The conviction of the Holy Spirit was heavy on Saul, and that's exactly what he needed if he was to become an authentic follower of Jesus. It's the love of God that terrifies the reckless sinner that's fighting against God and in danger of hellfire. It's not true love that won't warn hell-deserving sinners about the horrible danger they are soon to face. After this divine encounter, there were only two options left to Saul, either obey the command or rebel. 
The Lord was going to add a dimension to this divine confrontation that would make it very hard to rebel against. And we will see this when we get to verse 8. We are told in verse 7 that the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. We need to include what Paul said in other places in Acts to get the picture of this account. This is only a synopsis of the event, but enough is given to make the point Dr. Luke was striving to leave the reader with, which was the radical conversion of Saul. In chapter 26, verse 14, Paul said, We all fell to the ground, and I heard the voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. We see from this that all the men were knocked to the ground. But from what's recorded in chapter 9, the other men must have finally got to their feet, but were speechless. They were overwhelmed with what had happened. The other men didn't hear what the Lord said to Saul because it wasn't for their ears. Yet they heard a sound that let them know something supernatural was taking place. I imagine that they all saw the light from heaven but didn't see anyone, as Luke wrote. Could it be possible that the light which suddenly came upon Saul was from Jesus coming to him, but the others didn't see the Lord, only an otherworldly light? That's just a thought. I don't doubt that the conviction of the Holy Spirit that fell upon Saul fell upon the other men as well. When Saul told them what happened, what they experienced would be a strong influence upon them to become followers of Messiah themselves. We aren't told their story, since this one is all about Saul. In verse 8, we are told that Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. This must have been a traumatic experience. Why did the Lord supernaturally blind Saul? Because he was a proud, strong-willed, religious man that was totally committed to following the Mosaic Law as he had learned it from Gamaliel, a renowned rabbi of the day and one of the rulers of the Sanhedrin Council. Saul was thoroughly defined by the religious doctrine that he needed to be shaken out of, or he would continue in the bondage of a dead religion that had complete control over him. The Lord knew that confronting Saul on the Damascus Road would open his eyes to the truth about Jesus. But Saul needed something more, and by blinding him, he would receive a fatal blow to his evil pride. He would be led by the hand as a helpless man and stumble into Damascus in defeat and humiliation. The famous Saul, the persecutor of the church, defender of Judaism, was being led by the hand stumbling into the city, and news about this must have spread like wildfire. His humiliation brought with it a growing conviction that was so intense that he didn't eat or drink for three days. Saul was in agony of heart, mind, and soul. Overwhelming conviction gripped him, for he needed this to comprehend the horrendous evil he was committing in persecuting Christ's church and the depravity that defined him as a sinner. This experience was so intense he would never forget it, and this helped him to walk faithful with the Lord when he would experience times of intense persecution. This is what it took to get Saul's attention, and God's love is so great and his wisdom so vast that he will not shrink from shaking people to the core of their being if that's what it takes to bring them to salvation. In verse 9, we are given a look at the fierce conviction that gripped Saul. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This wasn't a religious exercise in an effort to earn God's favor, but was an overwhelming conviction that was totally consuming him. He was oblivious to his own physical needs or to what people said about him or to him. Some people may have thought he was going insane, and I think he would have if he refused to submit to God. During these three days, he must have been unconsolable while sitting in utter darkness and having his sins come up before him in all of their horror. Every person he persecuted, beginning with the murder of Stephen, must have been haunting him and demonstrating that he wasn't righteous, but a hell-deserving rebel. His hands were stained with blood, and he inflicted upon God's people cruel punishments, suffering and pain. To this point in the story, we have seen God's provenient grace in leading Saul to repentance. 
Now you will see the Holy Spirit break through the hard religious veneer of a man to bring him into saving grace that leads to true salvation. In verses 10 through 14, Dr. Luke recorded, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority of the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Let's take a moment to look at Ananias. There are a lot of traditions about him, even among the Muslims, that say he was a godly man. But traditions don't mean that what they say is true. The Greek church claims that he was one of the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out to preach and perform miracles, but there's absolutely no evidence to support this claim. When Paul testified before the Jewish mob in Jerusalem, he said in chapter 22, verses 12 and 13, A man named Ananias came to me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see. Paul emphasized the Jewishness of Ananias because he was speaking to a Jewish crowd and that Ananias was held in high esteem among the Jews of Damascus. He didn't tell them that Ananias had become a follower of Messiah, which might have made this violent crowd go ballistic. He told them that Ananias prayed for him to receive his sight, and it was immediately restored. Yet Paul didn't tell them that Ananias prayed that he would be baptized in the Holy Spirit and that he was instantly filled. Beyond what we are told in the book of Acts, we don't truly know anything else about Ananias. But what we read about him in these verses reveals some wonderful character traits about him. It was an expression of divine wisdom to send Ananias to Saul, since he was a devout man that had a good reputation among the Jews. The Lord came to him in a vision telling him to go minister to Saul, and he obeyed. We learn from this that he was a man in right relationship with God, that he was a man of prayer and was obedient to what the Lord commanded. How many Christians in our day and in our nation could the Lord go to and give such a command because they are in right relationship with God and would obey Him no matter the cost? If we want the Lord to do more through us, then we must cultivate a loving relationship with Him through a vibrant life of prayer and love of His Word. Then we must learn how to quickly and explicitly obey what the Lord commands us through His Word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. There will never be a contradiction between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Any discrepancy between the two reveals that we haven't heard from the Holy Spirit, for He will never speak contrary to the Word of God. Something else we need to see about Ananias is that he knew the voice of the Lord, so when he spoke, the man of God obeyed. If we aren't in a deep abiding relationship with Jesus, then we aren't going to hear His voice. The instructions Ananias was given were exact. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Ananias was even told that the Lord had given Saul a vision that a disciple of Jesus would lay his hands on him and he would receive his sight again. This way Saul would know without a doubt the supernatural origin of what was happening to him. Now Ananias did have an objection, but after the Lord answered him, the subject was dropped and his obedience followed. This is a good example of loving obedience. The objection Ananias had is that Saul's reputation had preceded him, for the saints in Damascus knew he was on his way to persecute the church. They knew he had already successfully imprisoned many disciples from Jerusalem and Samaria and that he sanctioned the murder of Stephen. They also knew that he had been given authority to persecute the church by the chief priests at the temple in Jerusalem. This meant that Saul could have had a highly organized plan to persecute the saints in Damascus and this must have caused them great concern over what was to come. Then in verses 15 and 16 we read, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The Lord didn't have to explain himself. 
He is the king of kings and lord of lords, and his first command to Ananias should have been enough. Yet we are given a glimpse of the sternness and kindness of God. The Lord showed Ananias a little of the plan he had for Saul, and this is an expression of God's forbearance. His sternness is revealed in how he said, Go. And this makes me think that he wasn't happy with Ananias questioning him. If the Lord told him to go, that should have been all that was needed, and he should have explicitly obeyed. For there to be such obedience, there must be unquestioning trust in the Lord so that there's no need for explanations. Not just that, when the Lord sends, the end results are up to him, not us. Whether Ananias lived or died, was in prison or left meeting Saul as a free man, wasn't his to worry about. His responsibility was to simply obey. To live such a life of reckless abandonment to Christ may seem to us radical, but that's only because we are such rebels. A life of loving obedience to God can only be obtained if we have a burning love for Him that compels us to trust Him no matter what He commands. Saul was a chosen instrument to carry Jesus' name and salvation to the Gentile world, including many of their kings. He would also testify before the Jews scattered around the Roman Empire and even in Israel itself. The fact that Saul was chosen doesn't mean he didn't have a say over the matter. Being chosen doesn't rob us of our free will. It just means that a person is called by God for a given purpose and the person must submit to God to accomplish the divine will. There's never a time in the life of people where God robs them of the gift of the free will that he gave them. Some people can cross a line in their rebellion where the Lord will no longer call them, but that's still not robbing them of their free will. It's actually giving them over to their free will and the evil they have chosen. Now let's take a step further by looking at the point found in verse 16 where the Lord told Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The Lord didn't tell Saul that he must suffer for him without having any choice in the matter. And this wasn't a punishment for his sins that he had committed in persecuting the church. This was a call to a deeper life in Christ, not a robbery of Paul's free will. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul wrote, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Such a prayer can only come from a free will that chooses Jesus above the dung of this world. He wanted to know Christ, and this is what made the man the radical that he was. This passion after God wasn't forced upon him, for such a heart can't come out of an organic robot that's programmed to perform a given service that has no choice over the matter. A cry like Paul's can only come out of a free moral agent that has tasted of the excellency of knowing Christ and has made the decision to love and follow him no matter the cost. This is the same with the yearning desire to know the power of Christ's resurrection, which is all about living the victorious Christian life that Jesus purchased for us through his atonement. Everything in these two verses is about relationship with Jesus, and this can't be forced or done against a person's will. And when Paul said that he wanted to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, this isn't about God forcing a man to do something against his own free will, but about a man who loves Jesus so much that he won't run away from the call of God no matter the cost. This is the fiery love of Christ that's all-consuming, and this is why Paul would suffer for Jesus, and this is why the Lord could say that he would show Paul how much he would suffer to fulfill the call upon his life. Nothing but an all-consuming love for God could compel a man to do what Paul did, and God wouldn't accept such a life from a man who didn't love him with his entire being. This is a beautiful picture of the biblical faith, And this is what every Christian is called to live out to its fullest. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time. And may God richly bless you.
as you seek him in spirit and in truth. No more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill. Let healing waters bear away your gift.